Admiral, let me ask you about China and Latin America. Uh, they seem to be growing their footprint there, One Belt, One Road, uh, other things that they're doing there. Uh, I know you can't address all of that from your perspective, but from your perspective, what can you address and tell me about what you can do and what we can do to help you to try to push back against China in our own neighborhood? The national defense strategy rightly calls out China as a competitor. It's, it's gone beyond that around the world, frankly. We're in, we're in conflict with China in the information space and for the, of the values and democracy. We see that in this hemisphere, over 60 port projects. Uh, that includes what we see in the NORTHCOM and, and the SOUTHCOM, uh, 56 in SOUTHCOM in the Caribbean. Uh, they've locked up uh, big development areas both sides of the Panama Canal, significant <laughs> IT infrastructure investments. Uh, they have military dimensions to their involvement in space stations in a couple of the nations. Any discussion by China that this is soft power is simply not the truth. Uh, in the information space, we see where China state spokesmen are, are outright just blatantly uh, lying about uh, some of the causality in Venezuela with respect to the electrical infrastructure, which was clearly uh, Maduro's ineptness uh, is a reason why the country doesn't have electrical power and China blaming it on the U.S. So across the front, democracy, human rights, rule of law, sovereignty, uh, our partners and the values that this neighborhood has are aligned on those dimensions, and, and I don't know how China's I know how China's don't align across those dimensions. And so I, the best response for us is to be that strong, reliable, consistent partner, to be able to deliver our security assistance on time with a program that has a return on investment for America and, and enhances the security of our partners. That starts with intelligence sharing. I get my best advice, uh, best insights from the Chief of Defense yesterday, for example, on the phone with the Brazilian Chief of Defense and the Colombian Chief of Defense with respect to insights on the Venezuela situation. But, but again, back to China, uh, completely unhelpful in Venezuela and across the hemisphere. The, the one belt, one road in front of that term is certainly a, epitomizes what they're up to. One way for China's way. Well, I, I get concerned sometimes we look at China and we think about the South China Sea and, and places over there in the Western Pacific, and we forget that, uh, that they're present in our own hemisphere. And, and I'm concerned about that. I think a lot of us are very concerned about that. And we want to make sure that we're giving you the resources you need to accomplish what you have to accomplish in your mission, that is to protect us and protect our neighbors in this hemisphere. So please let us know in the future what you need for us to give to you that you need to do your job, and I'd like for us to do it. General, if we could very quickly, I'm going to run out of time, I'd like to know if a, a space sensor uh, would address NORTHCOM's requirements for missile detection and tracking for both ballistic and hypersonic missiles. Uh, yes, sir. I, my view is that it's absolutely critical for us to have a space-based sensing layer, a, a proliferator LEO uh, approach uh, to get after the advancing threats that we see with both ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and uh, hypersonics, as you mentioned. Good. Mr. Chairman, my time's about to run out, but I would make this observation. It's pretty easy to look around the world and think that our greatest threats are in Asia or in the Middle East or uh, you know, with Russia, but we see a lot of those same threats visiting themselves here in North America and in South America, and I hope that we'll never forget that it's our homeland that makes the most importance to her and our neighbors to our south. So I hope you'll let us know what we can do to be supportive of you. Thank you. I yield back. Hey, and the point is worth emphasizing. We have had, obviously, a focus uh, in the National Security Armed Services Committee on the Middle East, um, and while well, Afghanistan and Iraq you know, dominated in the, the Middle East and the Asian region. Um, and as a consequence, and we haven't touched on this yet today, a lot of assets are not available. Um, to the Southern Command. Uh, they've been redirected. Now, that's coming back a little bit since we've drawn down um, completely out of Iraq, or we were completely out of Iraq, drawn down considerably in Iraq and Afghanistan. But it is a challenge for all of these missions that we're talking about uh, that you've kind of been at the, the back of the uh, buffet line here in, in terms of assets. So we, we need to, I think, reemphasize the importance of this region. Uh, Mr. Gallego. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield my time to Representative Cisneros. Thank you, Mr. Gallego. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, I just want to follow up on Mr. Courtney's question regarding the letter from the, the former Southcom commanders. Um, uh, you know, Secretary Pompeo dismissed uh, the State Department statistics that suggested U.S. aid programs in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, you know, had an impact on reducing homicide rates and migrants fleeing their countries. 
um, suggesting that the aid programs really had no positive impact at all. Uh, Admiral Feller, I knew you're, know you're new to the position, but uh, can I just get your assessment on what impact you think those aid programs will have on how you can do your job and be successful down there in those three countries? I had the opportunity to visit uh, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala within weeks of taking command because of the importance uh, that that region has and the connection with the United States, our neighborhood. And, and I'll be in Honduras next week again. And I had the opportunity in each country to go visit some of the poorest uh, neighborhoods, and, and, and I wanted to talk to people and, and find out what, uh, what was on their minds, what was uh, influencing them to make decisions, whether to turn to crime, organized crime, or to travel to the United States. And one conversation with a young man who'd gone all the way to the border of Mexico and the U.S. and come back just resonates with me. And I, I said to him, um, well, why did you leave? And he said, well, my neighbors had some food because they had family in the United States sending money back. We were starving. And uh, we, I knew how dangerous this was. The government was broadcasting the messages. But I, I wanted to keep my family from starving. So I went anyway. I said, why did you come back? He said, because it was really, really dangerous when I got up on the border. So there's, there's uh, not one solution set, uh, sir. It's uh, got to be a broad series of... Uh, kits that work, uh, a suite, and, uh, the, and the nations have to play and participate as well. And so all those dynamics got to fit together and, and create sustainable security at home and here. Uh, we, we forget sometimes that these are fragile democracies that are less than a generation old that we're going through civil war in our lifetime. So that plays into this too. I will say with respect to mill to mill, uh, the programs are working. Uh, my, I won't assess, uh, I, I don't, can't assess USAID uh, versus everything else, but uh, uh, in Guatemala, the special forces that we've trained are stopping drugs that are flowing to the United States. And as Ms. Wilberger, uh, Secretary Wilberger has said, uh, those programs are going to be permitted to continue at the mill-to-mill -mill level. So would you, would you say you agree with the, uh, the statement from your predecessors that diplomacy and USAID is an important part and that it's needed there down in those regions? Those are highly esteemed uh, mentors I respect. Uh, if, from a, a fundamental principle uh, around the world, uh, it's, it's important to uh, have diplomacy and all the toolkits available. Uh, but I also would, would pivot to say I think ensuring that our partners are doing their part and putting pressure on them is an important part of the equation. And so I have actually seen evidence that the additional pressure we're placing on this being true partnership, two-way, is, uh, is changing some dynamics in a helpful way. Mr. Rapuano, um, news reports indicate that the Acting Secretary of Defense sent a memo to the Comptroller requesting by May 10th a list of military construction projects of sufficient value to provide up to $3.6 billion in funding for its consideration to defer in favor of the President's border wall. This committee has yet to receive that memo. Can you assure me that the memo will be shared with this committee, and when, it will, and when will it be shared? Uh, I can assure you the memo will be shared as soon as possible. You're talking about the memo in which he makes a decision with regard to 2808? Mm -hmm. Yes, he fully intends, and he has stated so, that uh, he will be sharing this with Congress. All right. And is the, the comptroller, he's in process of, of um, identifying specific projects. Has he made a determination? Um, yet that the border wall is necessary to support troops? Uh, he is still awaiting the Joint Staff assessment with regard to uh, the role that the barriers play. And when he receives that assessment, he will make the decision. All right. So have you been involved in those conversations regarding what criteria beyond simple no forms of military housing projects that have been already awarded or will be awarded this physical year? will be followed to identify military construction projects that will be delayed to pay for the president's wall? If so, what are that criteria? And that we're going to have to take for the oh. record because we're yep. just completely out of time, and I'm pretty sure the answer we'll provided for the record. wouldn't be terribly satisfactory anyway. Um, just for the committees, we have not yet been told what projects are the money's going to be taken from. Um, we continue to ask that question in a variety of different forums, and the sooner we can get that answer. Um, I wouldn't get, go so far as to say the happier we're all going to be, but at least the more informed we will all be about uh, what our challenges are. Uh, so 
we are still waiting uh, to find out exactly where that money is going to go. And that decision has not been made by the Secretary yet? Correct. Right. Apparently. Uh, but uh, as soon as it is, we, we'd like to know what it is. Ms. Stefanik. Thank you, Chairman Smith. General O'Shaughnessy, thank you for visiting my office yesterday. Can you describe NORTHCOM's role in the Missile Defense Agency's decision-making process for determining the benefits and location of potential third continental interceptor site on the East Coast? Uh, yes, ma'am, and thank you for the time yesterday uh, to talk about this and, and other issues. Um, NORTHCOM, as the, as the operator, if you will, um, has a, a, a significant input with MDA relative to what that uh, future would look like. We started with over 50 uh, different air locations that we're looking at. We look closely with MDA uh, for our operational criteria that we want to be uh, that we wanted to be uh, included in that. Uh, we provide an assessment uh, to MDA and work with MDA for that, uh, and that has been incorporated into the MDA's ongoing work in this regard. Thank you. Can you expand upon the operational criteria? Sure, without going into uh, great classified uh, detail, but broadly what we're looking at is, as you know, we have two interceptor sites already, at one at Fort Greeley uh, and one in, Ala in, in, in California at Vandenberg. Uh, one of the uh, opportunities this would provide us is a dispersal for that. It would potentially give us a look, uh, the opportunity for a shoot, look, shoot, and that's just pure geometry and geography, if you look at uh, what that would allow us to do. And of course, we need other sensors to be able to actually uh, be able to take full advantage uh, of that. And of course, we want to look at what is the effectiveness uh, of the location in order to defend uh, our defended area, which obviously includes the uh, United States. And in terms of your assessment, we're working with the SecDef to get a timeline as to when the preferred site would be announced. So without getting into the specific site, um, I, can you expand upon how the recommendation and assessment uh, was given to MDA? And by that I mean, did you rank the three sites? Did you look at specific operational capabilities and say what sites meet those capabilities? How did the assessment, how was that formed? Our, our input is early in that process in the sense that we are providing the input into MDA who then uh, uh, collocates or uh, takes all of those inputs and puts them together into uh, a recommendation that they will ultimately give uh, to OSD through Dr. Griffin's office. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Yeager. I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Carver Hall. Sorry. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, in California and the Central Coast, we now experience a year-round fire season. It's no longer um, for a smaller period of time. And in, throughout California, and again, in my district specifically, every time we experience one of these major events, we depend on the Defense Department, to be specific, the California National Guard. We recently were successful in helping them get more equipped with Black Hawk Black Hawk helicopters. But as we rely on the California National Guard, one thing has become evident. In order for us to use some equipment, um, they have now identified a challenge. Governors have requested the use of unmanned systems for emergency disasters, search and rescue, and defense support to federal and other civil authorities like the Coast Guard. However, unlike all other assets in the National Guard, inventory, there is a restriction on their use, requiring the, under DOD policy, that the Secretary of Defense himself must sign off on each individual use, a far too long of a process that is potentially life-threatening for our communities. NORTHCOM is a part of that domestic use chain, and we understand you have worked with incident commanders in California several times to employ them when approved. General O'Shaughnessy, do you see any reason to continue prohibiting governors' immediate access to unmanned systems to help protect our citizens during emergencies? And two, how can we help expedite this process to ensure timely response to disasters? Yeah, thank you for your highlighting the great work that the Guard is doing to, in support of those uh, wildfires. Um, in fact, we work closely with uh, Dave Baldwin, your, your tag, General Baldwin, and in fact, I've ridden on those very uh, uh, helicopters that you mentioned uh, in looking at some of the fires that were uh, happening uh, in California earlier this year. Um, one of the things I will say is that the 
UAS, as you mentioned, are a high demand, low density uh, asset. They are globally, uh, all of our combatant, my sister combatant commanders do not have uh, the ISR that they require. And as such, it's been trying to, to look at those assets on the global front to see where is it needed. And it's not just the asset themselves, but it's also the, the work that has to be done on the back end. We call it the PED. You, know, you have to process the information that comes from that UAS. Uh, and so that is why we keep that at a, at a very high level. Um, what, what I will say is I pledge to continue to work with Dave Baldwin. Um, in fact, last year there was an occurrence during a fire season uh, when uh, he uh, called me directly to ask for assistance to get the clearance from the Secretary of Defense, and within hours of his call, uh, we actually got the Secretary of Defense's uh, approval to use that asset. And so I think the processes are in place. We can continue to expedite it, and I commit to work closely with the Guard, but I, I am not uh, opposed to the system as it sits today, uh, and the OSD and the Secretary of Defense office has been responsive to the requests that we have made uh, in the past. Well, that sounds great, but as long as it works as we think it does, can we put in some kind of performance uh, that uh, when that communication comes from various jurisdictions, there's some kind of response period so that we know within what time period we can get some kind of an answer that that will take place? Because when these incidences are happening, every minute, Every hour is essential and critical. And if it's going to take days, well, you might as well not have this in place, not even have that asset available. Is there any way we can look at the system, the chain of command and communication, to make sure that there's a timely um, decision-making point so that communities could get the help that they deserve and need? Uh, yes, I, I don't, we can't commit to what the answer would be at the end of that, but I do believe it would be uh, prudent uh, for us to put a timeline uh, to make sure that we are held accountable for getting a decision, whether the decision or yes or no, yes it is available or no it's not available, yes it can be used, no it won't. But, so I work with uh, both you, I work with General Baldwin, uh, and work with OSD to determine what that timeline ought to look like. Great. I, I would appreciate your office following up with mine. Thank you very much. I would just quickly add that, uh, to my knowledge, when those requests are delayed, it, it is because there is a multiple demand signal for the, the high demand, low density asset. When the system is available, the decisions are made very quickly. Well, it would be great to look at the past 20 times that's been requested to see what, uh, how efficient the system is working and where we need to make improvements. So thank you very thank much. You. Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Fowler, I want to commend your very strong statement on the brutal Maduro regime at the start of this hearing and the way in which uh, Cuba and Russia have violated Venezuelan sovereignty. In simple terms, what tools do you have in the kit to prevent enhanced Russian meddling or even Chinese meddling or Cuban meddling in Venezuela as we try and shape a positive outcome? Clearly, the uh the reason this crisis has gone so long is, is squarely rests, responsibility squarely rests, as you pointed out, Congressman, on Cuba, Russia, and to some extent China. China has an opportunity, I think, uh, in the international community to step up and help with this, and they haven't. The, in the information space, in the intelligence space, in our partner, in our security cooperation, we, we have the tools we need, and we're using the full range of those tools from cyber uh, to public uh, messaging and information security cooperation. We're using uh, assets diligently and quietly in a number of ways to help paint the picture of what's going on inside and outside the country. And then we're sharing that uh, with the interagency in full cooperation in a manner that uh, matters. Uh, the, the region has been exceptionally united. Last week I was in Colombia, and the Colombian Chief of Defense and myself hosted a multinational a border meeting with Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, and Colombia. We, we discussed the range of challenges that affect the region. Central to all of those was Venezuela, and to the extent to which Venezuela complicates and magnifies every single problem that affects the region, and the extent to how these external state actors are meddling in a way that's unhelpful to democracy. So those discussions lead to, to uh, coordinated calls for action, and we're all united and we're all standing firmly behind uh, diplomacy and the need for this democratic process to work, and it will. Uh, President Trump suggested a complete embargo of Cuba if Cuban troops don't cease 
their activities in support of Maduro. If you were to get such an order, do you have the assets necessary to effectuate such an embargo? Again, back to Cuba's uh, centrality in, in all things bad in this hemisphere, uh, including how they're just simply completely protecting Maduro, all the inner circle, Praetorian Guard around Maduro, the intelligence service all infiltrated. And so the putting pressure on Cuba is a good thing. Maximum pressure, a good thing. Uh, we're aware of the embargo, uh, those orders, and we're carefully uh, looking at uh, plans and what it would take to do that. And I'm not prepared to discuss in open setting what it would take. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, uh, looking more broadly to uh, Chinese investment in the Southcom AOR, how should Congress think about or be concerned with uh, Chinese investment in and around the Panama Canal? L looking around the world, we have to think globally about China. Uh, Certainly the South China Sea and indo pacom area are a central piece of this, but they're, they're a global power and they're acting globally. Their investments are global. Uh, the, the number of agreements that China's signed with the government of Panama, the extent to which they've uh, locked up contracts for infrastructure, for IT, for port facilities is an area of concern. Panama still wants to partner with us, uh, and we still share much more in common than they do with China but they've turned to an economic partner of necessity, vice choice. And so we have to look at that more broadly. And our strategy in the Department of Defense as part of the whole government strategy is looking at those high leverage points around the world where we need to ensure the access and influence that the United States needs as a, as a global leader. Sure. Uh, quickly, uh, Assistant Secretary Rapuano, first of all, I want to thank you for your help with getting the Cyberspace Solarium Commission off the ground. I know it's been a bureaucratic struggle, but uh, I think we're on a, a good path, and I want to thank you for your participation in that. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the future of 5G um, and some of the decisions our allies are making uh, in terms of excluding Huawei and ZTE from their network and debating that, but it seems like we still have a little bit more work to do here at home. Could you just talk briefly about uh, your concern, if any, about Huawei's activity in the United States in general, particularly in rural networks where we don't really have good visibility? Uh, we, well, thank you, and thank you very much for the role that you played with the Solarium Commission, and it's been very productive thus far and look forward to it. With regard to 5G, uh, obviously we have very significant concerns. We have concerns about Huawei. We have concerns about uh, allies and partners in particular in terms of systems that may be allowing Chinese access and the accessibility of information that we are sharing with partners and allies. So that is a, an ongoing effort, engaging with them to uh, give them a better appreciation for what the risk and the threat is. And if I, if I could follow up, General's time expired, we are going to do a couple things which are on this point within the bill. One is to try to take further steps to make sure that we cut off Huawei and ZTE from participating in having any part of our, our 5G going forward. But one critical part of that is to develop the domestic capability. Because one of our problems is we don't have any domestic capability, and I forget the technological term, but the stuff that makes it go from the device out into the unit, we don't build that. There's a couple of European companies, um, uh, Nokia and Ericsson and Samsung. We are trying to develop a domestic capability, which DOD is they're buying their own 5G piece of it could help with. So that's something we're going to be really interested in blocking Huawei and ZTE, but also making sure that we have a domestic capability uh, so we have that alternative, because regrettably those other three that I mentioned aren't, aren't necessarily providing what we need. So we look forward to working with you, and I know Congressman Gallagher, you have a big interest in this, so we'll certainly uh, loop you in and work, work on that as well. Uh, with that, uh, Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all of our witnesses uh, this morning. Uh, General O'Shaughnessy, the president's budget is proposing reallocating a billion dollars in funding for military construction, including funds intended to repair hurricane damage installations along the East Coast for construction of a border wall. Uh, during the recess, I toured five of our bases, one of which was Camp Lejeune, that is um, filled with buildings that are tarped. Um, and I remember them saying they had about $3 billion worth of damage there. In your estimation, what poses a greater security challenge to our homeland? Asylum seekers and economic migrants on foot or ill-equipped Marines and soldiers living and training in unsafe buildings? 
Yeah, ma'am, the, the individual services are the ones who, uh, in this case, the Commandant of the Marine Corps is, is the one who is actually working the recovery efforts for Camp Lejeune. It doesn't fall under the NORTHCOM responsibility. Okay. Um, then Secretary Rapuano, there's been an analysis from Bur the Brookings Institute that a strategy centered around capturing high-value targets in counter-narcotics operations intensifies violence by fomenting turf wars, which lead to corruption of law enforcement officers. What strategies is the U.S. engaged in counter-narcotics operations employing in order to ensure that they do not perpetuate corruption and further destabilize the region? So I'll, I'll turn to Secretary Wilberger to address that issue. Hi, thank you, ma'am. Um, I don't directly uh, have responsibility for counter-narcotics <coughs> policy, but I do have responsibility, obviously, for the region. Um, from the de Department of Defense's perspective, both uh, um, counter-narcotics activities as well as counter-trafficking activities is a major uh, line of effort for the department. We, we do this in support of local law enforcement as well as our, our uh, interagency partners, the Coast Guard in particular. Uh, and a, um, and but a part and parcel of everything we do as a department in the region is, again, develop, developing the capabilities and the capacity of these local governments uh, to defend themselves against their uh, external as well as internal threats. Um, earlier this, uh, this morning, the chairman brought up Plan Columbia. I just want to highlight that, that su the success of Plan Columbia over a couple decades is because it had bipartisan support from Congress for decades. Uh, the kind of uh, sustained partner capacity programs we need to be successful across the host of, th of threats in the region, not just counter-narcotics or counter-trafficking or the, uh, the uh, drug cartels, really to s takes sort of our sustained commitment to these partners. And so... Um, you know, the, the strategy is a whole of government one in terms of uh, addressing the challenges of the region, but with respect to our, our particular um, capabilities in the department, it's really ensuring that our partners have uh, resources and capabilities to uh, secure themselves internally. So who should I talk to specifically within your department on this issue then? Uh, Secretary o uh, Assistant Secretary Owen West has responsibility for our counter-narcotics programs. All right, thank you. Uh, I just would note that uh, no funding has been taken from the 284 counter drug programs for, for barrier construction, either to NORTHCOM or Southern No, but Command. I was asking a different question. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, Secretary Wheelbarger, in your written statement, you describe the need to address great power competition with China and Russia in the Western Hemisphere as they seek to expand their political, economic, and military influence throughout Latin America. The, um, the initiatives by China are pretty uh, widespread around the world. Uh, according to Pew polls in 2016, 66% of Latin America held favorable views of the United States. But by 2017, the favorability had dropped by 19 points. Given this considerable and rapid decline, uh, are we still able to appeal to militaries in the region as a source of training, equipment, and leadership? Are we still well positioned on the field uh, that you mentioned? Yes, thank you. Uh Global competition with China is, as the National Defense Strategy indicated, our, one of our key priorities as a department. We uh, stress to our partners, as uh, Admiral Fowler mentioned earlier, it's not just what equipment you can get or um, what training you can get, but actually how much you can trust the partner that you are um, partnering with. And the United States continues to be well positioned throughout the region to be the security partner of choice. I think um, from the day-to-day -day activities with our, from uh, throughout the ranks of our government, whether it be our training uh, in, in in the United States or in the region, uh, we continue to be, be in well positioned to compete and grow in our competition in, in the region. And I would defer to Admiral Fowler if you have any other thoughts. The, thanks for the question. The, uh, from the mill-to-mill -mill perspective in my travels, and I've met with almost every single chief of defense or minister of defense, and we try to get out beyond that when my, when my wife goes with me, uh, the people still want to and value that relationship with the United States above all. So that, that whatever the polls say, ma'am, what I'm seeing in person and what my team is seeing is a, an affinity to work with us and trust us. I know my time's expired, but I, while you may dismiss the polls based on your personal interactions with people, I think it's very important to um, recognize that there is there has been slippage and what are we gonna do to, to raise it? Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and 
thanks to all of you for being here today, and it's good to see Cheryl Shaughnessy again. Uh, used to serve with him a few years ago. And my first question is to Admiral Fowler. You know, Venezuela used to be the richest, wealthiest country in South America and in the region. Uh, both the dictatorship and the, and the socialist policies have broke it. Can you just give us your, you know, your feedback on just how bad it is for the average Venezuelan? Shortly after I assumed command, I had the opportunity to go out on the United States Naval Ship Comfort, which we had deployed to the region to provide comfort, uh, medical support, life-saving stability to the entire region that was impacted by this crisis. And I got to see some small children, eight-year-old, nine-year-old kids. Uh, the average Venezuelan has lost 20 pounds in the last year. Uh, these kids were emaciated. They'd, this is the first time they'd received any medical treatment in their lives. Uh, I don't think they knew who I was or what I was about. Uh, their mother certainly did. And uh, the look in her eye uh, and uh, the conditions that she represented impacts the entire region. Over three million people have been uh, migrated out of Venezuela. They're on tr it's on track to be worse than the Syria migration crisis uh, by the end of this year. And that is uh, affecting all aspects of life. 90% uh, of the people uh, are malnutrition and starving. Uh, most of the countries without power, we see that daily. And it's uh, a dictatorship and brutal in all ways. The governance has devastated uh, its own people. That's what I'm hearing. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, on a different tact, it seems to me that Colombia and Chile has been sort of the pillars of our engagement in South America, or at least our closest relationships. Do I have that characterized right? Colombia is an example when we have a, a long view. We stick to a plan over 20 years, as uh, Secretary Wilberger uh, uh, stated, uh, with people committed to their own democracy, their own uh, security, uh, where we can have impacts. Colombia this year is on track to, ch to train over 1,000 security personnel in Central America that those security personnel are going to contribute to the security of their countries, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and beyond, and the United States. They're a capable and willing partner. Chile stepped up and has stepped up consistently. They have uh, participated in some of our international exercises at a leadership level, and they remain a, a very capable and committed partner. I sense from what I'm hearing from Brazil that there's a desire to draw closer with us, which is... I think uh, good news. Could you just give us a, a, your views or your perspective on the potential of what we can do with the stronger ties of Brazil? Brazil's a resource rich country that has the same values of us, the second largest democracy in the hemisphere. They are all in. We've been down to Brazil. They've been to see us. We're integrating our staffs. We're sharing information. They're looking for ways to strengthen uh, intelligence sharing, exercises, education. Uh, part of our uh, security assistance program is so important is this international military education and training. I met that it's referred to. It's on a State Department funded in foreign assistance. It's foundation. We build lifelong friends. I'm looking to double that this year, but I will need the support of Congress to uh, raise that level of, uh, of assistance. And, and Brazil's all in. They want to double the number of people they send to our schools. Thank you. General Shaughnessy, you have such an important mission. Uh, so does STRATCOM, so does the future of Space Command, and it seems like there's some overlapping potential there are mission areas. How do you deconflict? and what are some of the challenges there? Thank you. Yeah, I think every, it, it may be a, looked at as a challenge, but it's also an opportunity, uh, and we're clearly, as STRATCOM has morphed over several years, if you look at Cyber Command coming out, now we'll look at Space Command, and that has given us an opportunity to really look at all of the mission sets. Uh, and try to determine what's the best organizational uh, construct there. What I will say and report, without a doubt, it is a collabor collaborative um, uh, perspective that we're taking. And if you look at all of the players, whether it be General Heighton, whether um, it'll be at least under Air Force Base Command is um, being worked by J Jay Raymond, um, complete, uh, what, how do we best do this? That, that's the only question that's being asked. Uh, I think we'll be able to work our way through this, but in the end, I think we'll end up being stronger than we are today. Turn my mic back on. Are we, need, are we where we need to be when it comes to speediness of response? NORTHCOM detects threats, then STRATCOM would have to respond. Do we have that as seamless as possible? 
I, I would say we do, and then actually it's uh, NORTHCOM responds as well as the operational. We're actually the ones who do the ballistic missile defense, STRATCOM, and, and we're tied on the same conferences and, and literally uh, seconds, not, uh, not minutes, in the way we respond together. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Hill. Thank you. Thank you all for your service. Um, General O'Shaughnessy, you spend a great deal of time talking about Russian threats, including their investments in long-range, low-radar, cross-section cruise missiles that can be fired from aircraft or subs against targets within the United States, and in particular about advanced long-range cruise missiles capable of flying through the northern approaches. Can you talk about the potential capability of the F-35 in missile defense? Certainly, and, and as we look at the, these threats that you, that you mentioned, one of the reasons that we are uh, most concerned about it is we see not only a capability and a capacity, uh, we see a doctrine uh, where they are, uh, their very strategy as they articulate it um, is to take that uh, attacks on our infrastructure. Uh, and then we look at the patterns of behavior that they do. For example, their, their fly the missions that, that are clearly uh, uh, flying and practice attacks against uh, North America. And so to that end, we want to make sure we have the most uh, advanced capability that we can possibly have. Um, F-35 has proven itself. Um, in fact, we just heard it in the, in the news. It just uh, dropped in, uh, in combat in the, uh, in the latest, uh, within the last 24 or 48 hours. Um, but it's also, more importantly, it's the, it's the ability for it to fuse all of the capability together that becomes critically important because it's not just the end game is how you get after the cruise missiles. It's the sensors that have to all fuse together for that to work. And, and, and whether it be from a red flag scenarios that we see, or that we show the exercise that we do, we see the F-35's real uh, capability and capacity is its ability to essentially be the quarterback, if you will, to bring all that together. So we see it as vital going forward. So you need, you need them. <laughs> we need them and as many as we can, uh, we can procure. Great. Um, okay, and then along the same lines, what's your biggest challenge when dealing with Russian military aircraft in the U.S. and Canadian uh, air defense identification zones? Our biggest challenge we have right now is domain awareness. Uh, many of our systems were designed in the Cold War era. Um, and as the uh, Russians have advanced their capability, we need to stay ahead of that and advance our capability uh, and be able to uh, understand what is happening uh, in the Arctic, as an example, uh, where we are uh, currently challenged and need to advance our capabilities. So I think you mentioned there's been an increase in these interactions in the last few years. Is that correct? It's increased in the number, but uh, really it's, they've been up and down as they've gone through a modernization with their bombers. But more importantly, it's the complexity of the, uh, of the events that we're seeing. Uh, very complex, uh, very much uh, more integrated with multiple platforms uh, that has this concern. Thank you. Um, are there resources that you need that you're not currently receiving to execute this part of the Homeland Defense Strategy? Uh, as, as always, uh, much like my partner here um, in Southcom, uh, we're always looking to make sure that we have the adequate resources to defend our nation. Uh, we do, uh, but I will say that going forward, as this is, becomes more and more advanced weaponry, we want to make sure that we maintain uh, the ability to stay ahead of those threats uh, is probably our most pressing concern. So as we move to an all fifth generation fleet, is it fair to say that F-35 would be used for these missions as well? Yes. Okay. Um, Admiral Fowler, in your statement, you mentioned a Russian spy ship with the capability to map undersea cables. Are you telling us in, are you able to tell us in this setting what's being done to harden and protect the fiber optic systems that connect our world? I can speak broadly about Russia in the region. Uh, the specifics would not be able to go into in this setting, but uh, around the world, Russia is, uh, is advancing their interests in ways that are harmful, and uh, we see this around the world, and we see it in Latin America and uh, the Caribbean as well. So I guess that kind of leads to a, a, a simple summary from you all. Would you say, just in, in terms of uh, North and South America, who is our most dangerous and eminent threat? Uh, I would say in the, in the, um, in the long term, it's, it's China, without a doubt, as a nation, I think, as we look at the, the threat that China uh, presents us. But in the short term, we have um, significant concerns about the Russian capability and their patterns of behavior and, their, and what they've shown to be an intent. China, without a doubt, in our best defense is to ensure that our defense remains strong, that our people are ready, that we invest in it appropriately, and that we don't overlook the home game, the home game here in this hemisphere with security cooperation being key. It's a, such a, it's a small uh, dollar value with a high return on investment. And Ms. Wilbarger, would you agree? And Mr. Rapuano? Rap <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I sometimes describe it as, I think, uh, 
Uh, China is our chronic threat, and in some ways Russia is our acute threat right now, given their misbehavior around the world. But we have to make sure we address them equally, um, as well as uh, ensure stability around the world so we don't get distracted as we maintain that long-term long -term focus. Uh, I also strongly agree, and just on the partnerships and alliances, they, they're tremendous force multipliers for us. And the United States is unique in our history and ability to leverage those partnerships. Thank you all. Yield back. Thank you. Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral, if the DOD was prohibited from uh, it, contracting with any persons that had business operations with an authority of Venezuela that is not recognized as the legitimate government of Venezuela by the government of the United States, which capabilities would you expect could be impaired from our standpoint? More broadly, I think anything we can do to impact and pressure Venezuela and, and continue this this uh, necessary transition democracy, we, we should be doing. And I know we're looking at that across the, the full range. Uh, my, my suspicion is we haven't done it yet. We just haven't thought of it because the full court press from our leadership on. To the specifics of your question, I'm not uh, aware or understanding of any uh, impacts uh, on those, but we'd have to look at them case by case. Well, thank you for that response, and if you could take that for the record and, and provide responses, because I believe my colleague Mr. Waltz and I are going to introduce an amendment to the NDAA to assist you in achieving that pressure, but in doing so, we don't want to have the inverted effect of, of hamstringing DOD. I don't expect that it would do that. Your clarification that you can't think of a circumstance where it would is, is similarly helpful. Um, I, I want to now ask about how the United States is interacting with and engaging in the ongoing crisis in Venezuela. If the United States were to have uniform military in Venezuela engaging in operations, have we modeled out or planned or conducted analysis regarding how some of the other ALBA nations would react to such an action? Well, first, uh, looking at uh, the range of, of things we're thinking about, uh, discussing with our our partners, our allies, and within the interagency, uh, we're looking at ways to be helpful to the inevitable rise of legitimate Guaido government. And, uh, and then how do we set the table afterwards to ensure that those professional military forces uh, get the training, the assistance they need? This will be a regionally led uh, issue. Uh, the countries in the region that aren't democracies, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Cuba, and the external actors that don't believe in democracy, although they may say they do, uh, they're not going to be happy about anything we do. Uh, I mean, Russian news agencies had repeated reports of me. Other than unhappiness, which I appreciate and understand, are there other activities that we've had to analyze or plan for? For example, if we were to put uniform military on the ground in Caracas, do we have contingency plans for mass protests in other Latin American capitals? Because as I've analyzed um, how the region perceives the possibility of U.S. involvement, and I understand we've got to keep every option on the table, that U.S. involvement is very popular right now in Venezuela and with the Venezuelan diaspora, but U.S. direct involvement with uniform military is very unpopular with every other Latin American country. Um, if, if you're aware of information that, that is different or more up-to-date, I'd love to hear it. But I just wonder whether or not our military, and I know we're involved in a lot of train and equip missions with these other partner nations, if we're planning for the potential of the Venezuelan crisis erupting into a broader regional crisis if the arrival of American troops on the ground gives Maduro the ability to externalize his conflict, to scapegoat his own failures, and then to deny the organic efforts of the Venezuelan people to fight for a brighter future. Uh, I wouldn't uh, want to speculate on anything that Maduro's thinking. Uh, I'm not sure he does. But uh, w the details of the different course of action, things we're looking at, I would take in a closed session. Broadly, we're looking at, uh, as I've said, the leadership's been clear. Our job's to be ready, and we're on the balls of our feet. And, and I have no doubt, as the congressman for the 7th Special Forces Group, uh, that we are ready and we could take the fight to the enemy and we can win it. I just want to make sure that if we're going to have that fight and if it becomes necessary, that we have really thought out all the options when, in my experience, there is a good amount of latent resentment in some pockets of Latin America that date back to prior administrations and their involvement in, in the continent. And so uh, I uh, certainly am, am proud of that state of readiness, and I would similarly add that over the last decade or so, 
The great work at Southcom has greatly enhanced the capabilities of our partner nations. The Colombians, the Peruvians, they are no joke. They can bring the fight, and I think that that is a consequence of the great work that has been done at Southcom, and I hope that you know, as circumstances continue to change in Venezuela, that we leverage the great work that we've done so that we have, as you described, a regional approach and not a unilateral approach by the United States. I'd like to commence uh, the uh, seven special forces group and our teammates uh, in your district. They're ready, and they're ready to go, and they have a focus on the region, and uh, we actually need more of their presence. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Moulton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, and thank you all for everything you do to keep us safe. A lot of American lives are entrusted in your care. I want to actually pick up where Mr. Gates uh, left off and ask a similar question. Um, this kind of harkens back to the uh, Iraq experience. Uh, you say you have contingency plans if we were to have to do we were to do something in Venezuela. Do we have any plans for what happens on the day after? not just in other countries, but in Venezuela itself. We've obviously been through the experience of, of having great invasion plans and no plans for what to do next in uh, recent conflicts. The uh, complexity of the situation, the magnitude of the misery, is, is going to require every element of international unity that currently exists to focus on the recovery of the uh, economic uh, infrastructure, the oil infrastructure, port facilities, electrical infrastructure that Maduro's ruined. There are pl ongoing efforts to look at all aspects of this. It, uh, at my headquarters, we call it day now, because there is going to be a day when uh, the legitimate government takes over, and it's going to come when we least expect it, and it could be right now. So we're, uh, we're calling it day now planning. And do those plans exist in the contingency of uh, U.S. military intervention as well, Admiral? The, uh, our ability to be ready for anything that uh, the President's been clear might be on the table is, uh, is things we're looking at. We're on the balls of our feet. The details of what those plans look like, I would take in closed session. Okay. Um, I'd like to shift to uh, Mr. Gallagher's question about Panama. Uh, and, and I understand you, you answered it briefly, but just tell me in general here, um, you've all stated the influence of China is the greatest long-term threat to the security and safety of the United States. Uh, I would agree with you. What's the worst case scenario with the Chinese presence in Panama? I'd like to start by pointing out what Panama is doing for us. So the canal remains open and free, and the canal authority remains independent and, uh, and operational. Uh, Panama has stepped up their game in the drug interdiction through our security cooperation. Admiral, department. with all due respect, I'm asking about the worst case, not uh, the The best worst case. case is that I can't answer that question in that way a year, two years, five, or a generation from now because Panama Canal, both zones are, both the zone and the ends of the canal are controlled by Chinese and they actually influence uh, the Panama in a way that's uh, counter to any international interest. So since we're heading in that direction, maybe quickly, maybe slowly, what can we do to stop it? What should we be doing to turn Chinese influence away? Uh, because right now it just seems to be increasing. The military dimension that has to stay strong. Our partnerships must be consistent. We must be responsive in our security cooperation. Some of the tools that Congress has, has given us are good, but they're not responsive enough. The current uh, uh, way that we've implemented th uh, our 333 authorities are too slow. A lot of that is on the department to look itself in the mirror and f figure out how to uh, speed it up. Some of this could be better if we had two-year money and combatant yeah. commanders had some additional authority to deliver on small things that can help both our partners and the return on investment for the security of the United States. Admiral, in general, do you think we are doing enough as the United States of America to deter the, uh, the Russian and Chinese influence in our hemisphere? I'd say that uh, we're, we are doing everything we can and that will never be enough uh, uh, or fast enough. So we have to act with the speed of urgency. Uh, well, I mean, frankly, if their presence in the region were decreasing, I would say it's probably enough. I mean, it's headed in the right direction, but it doesn't seem to be headed in that direction. General, do you have any comment on this? Do you think we're doing enough to deter Russian and Chinese influence in our hemisphere? Uh, well, I would, I would agree with uh, Emma Fowler in that we, we do need to continue to engage here. I'll just use our own within uh, NORTHCOM AOR, look at the Bahamas, 
uh, is a, a nation 50 miles off the coast of, uh, of Florida, yet it's, uh, we're seeing Chinese influence right there. Uh, and it does not take a significant amount of, of dollars, frankly, um, for a very positive uh, effect. And so the more that we can look at it within this hemisphere uh, and focus our efforts not uh, just within in this particular area with China, the Asia Pacific region, but in the Western Hemisphere as well, I think we'll see the fruits of that uh, payoff fairly quickly. Well, I hope you'll be a partner with us in in the in, with the development of the NDAA to to help to help in that mission. Uh, Ms. Wheelbarg, we don't have much time left, but I just wanted to ask you, do you think Plan Columbia should be a model? Should Plan Columbia be a model that we duplicate uh, elsewhere? I think it's, it's dangerous to always think about duplicating um, programs in, co in countries or locations that are not exactly the same. But I will say, as, as a model of a whole-of-government approach and inter-branch inter approach to a, a particular problem set, it is a model. And I've used it as one of the um, examples I give of our security cooperation truly working, because it was long-term, it was sustained, it had bipartisan support, and it didn't just focus on tactics and operations, it focused on true defense in institution building, and that is the sort of thing we need to be doing around the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walton. I, I would say, you know, when we look back to the Central American countries where most of the migrants are coming from, uh, the, whether Plan Colombia is the exact model or not, but some sort of comprehensive plan in that region is probably the best thing we could do to deal with the migrant crisis that we have. Um, before I call on Mr. Walsh, I want, I want to welcome, welcome him to the, to the adults' table. Um, for those of you who don't know, we, we, we had to re reconfigure the room here. He used to be all by himself down there in front, right next to the witnesses, and now, now he has joined the rest of us. So, so welcome, and you are recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I've spent a little bit of time on forward outposts, and I, I like to consider it the, the forward combat post up there. But, but thank you for that, and, and, and thank you all for coming today. And uh, just to add to my Colleague Seth Moulton's uh, comment there, I, I do think Plan Columbia as a Green Beret, I'm a little, little bit invested in that one as the tip of the spear on Plan uh, Columbia. I do think it's a model for, for advise and assist and, and, and whole of government operations. Admiral, thank you for coming by uh, yesterday. You know, the, as a number of my colleagues have stated, I think I, I had a back and forth with with my good friend Tucker Carlson of, of Fox News on why should the American people care, really, uh, of what's going on uh, down in Venezuela. And I, I reminded him that the migration um, problem, the refugee problem from Venezuela is approaching the levels that we saw in Syria. Uh, and that we're approaching three to five million refugees by the end of, of 2019, destabilizing the area. I think that's it's important for us to, to to really take that message out on what this can do, what the Cubans, Russians, and Chinese are doing, not only in Venezuela, but doing it in Nicaragua as well, where we're also seeing a, a refugee flow. So given that dynamic, do you think it's a time, Admiral Fowler, for a coalition, humanitarian, uh, forcible if necessary, uh, intervention? Uh, do you think mili from a from a logistics and military standpoint that the Colombians, the Brazilians, possibly the French and Dutch, are ready with U.S. leadership to have that intervention, and do you think it would do more harm than good? I mean, do you think it would do um, more good than harm? I'd start with the <clears throat> level above that, Congressman, where it's time for a plan for the hemisphere. Uh, we, talk, we talked about Plan Columbia. We need, we need a plan for this hemisphere, uh, and uh, an initiative that recognizes mm -hmm. the importance of this hemisphere with all the various security dimensions that have been discussed today including the impact that this Venezuela crisis particularly has on all of us, this mass migration, uh, to the point of the partner unity, extremely important that the partners are unified, uh, partners and the allies, the Dutch, the French, uh, the UK, the Canadians, uh, to the extent that the diplomatic solution needs that kind of uh, bulk that militaries can bring to humanitarian intervention, I know in the US we're prepared to support. So it, it diplomatic and led I, and I it completely fast. agree with you. We need a broader plan, Latin America, but in the immediate term, while we're at an inflection, a crisis point in Venezuela, do you think that intervening with a humanitarian coalition led uh, is is viable as a viable option at this point? There's Would a need, you recommend it? There's a need for humanitarian assistance. It ought to have a, an international and USAID or an organization of American states face, 
And if asked, militaries would be our military and partners, I think, willing and ready to help support the do flow. We've that seen that already with the staging in Colombia and Brazil. Do you, do you assess that the Cuban security forces, which I've seen estimates ranging from 3,000 upwards of 20,000, Cuban security forces on the ground protecting Maduro, do you think they would oppose militarily a coalition intervention, particularly with Colombian and Brazilian involvement? I wouldn't want to speculate what uh, the Cubans would or wouldn't do. Uh, I think they're as, as likely as unpredictable as the Russians. The, uh, there would have to be uh, some level of cooperation and invitation from the legitimate Guaido government to make this work. Do you think it would be, I completely agree, do you think it would be helpful if Guaido offered amnesty and more overtly offered amnesty? Well, the am to the, for, in terms of peeling away uh, Maduro loyal uh, military officers? The amnesty offer is open, and uh, as I understand it, they're moving forward towards enacting that in legislation. That would be very ha helpful if the National Assembly passed that as part of the uh, of the package, but I, I think there's plenty of teeth to the amnesty. And again, the message I'd have to the military is believe in us, the, the world's united, there'll be amnesty, there'll be a place in our schools, there'll be a place to partner with us when there's a legitimate democracy. What do you assess as the Russian presence on the ground in terms of either military, Wagner group, you know, uh, surrogates, and, and what's their current mission and guidance and role? We saw recently uh, additional flights in, 100 or so, uh, technical special forces, other advisors. There are other Russians present. Uh, I wouldn't want to discuss in an open hearing what our estimate of their presence are, but it's, uh, it's significant and it's, uh, it's uh, contributing to the devastation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You? Thank you very much, Ms. Escobar. Thank you, Chairman, um, and good morning. Thank you all so much for your testimony this morning, and gentlemen, thank you especially for your service. Very grateful for it. Mr. Rapuano, the fiscal, 16, fiscal year 16 NDAA had a provision in it entitled Section 1059, Department of Defense Authority to Provide Assistance to Secure the Southern Land Border of the United States. In communications with Congress, the Department of Defense has cited this as one of their authorities for deploying service members to the southern border, including my community, El Paso, Texas. This authority requires a DOD report every three months. And yet, as we approach six months of active duty support at the southern border, this committee has not received a single one of these reports. The first report would have been due the first week of February. Why hasn't the department adhered to the law that they are citing and submitted the required report? Uh, Congresswoman, I am familiar with 1059. Uh, I will get more familiar with the reporting requirement. I'll follow up on that and ensure that we follow up if, uh, if we are not complying with our obligations. Great. And, and would you be able to have a timeline for when this committee and myself in particular would receive a copy of this report? Uh, as, as, fast, as fast as I can help make it happen. Okay, thank you, I'd appreciate that. Uh, Admiral, I so appreciated your perspective on having a plan for the hemisphere. Um, as I mentioned, I'm from El Paso, I represent El Paso, and we have seen a significant influx of essentially asylum seekers uh, arriving at our, our front doorstep. And I agree with the chairman when he says that really the best way to address what is a, a significant humanitarian challenge is to address what's happening in the Northern Triangle. I myself have called for hemispheric collaboration and cooperation. This is a shared responsibility and duty. Um, so with that in mind, and, and because I so appreciated that comment you made, can you speak to the efforts of the effort Southcom is engaged in in the critical Northern Triangle region to address the root causes of these immigration flows? And can you, do you think you can positively impact this humanitarian challenge that we're facing? We're working with our partners in Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Belize, uh, not traditionally considered part of the Northern Triangle, but part of that region, uh, to work on professional forces. Professional forces have legitimacy with their people. We have a human rights program that is now in its 20th year. We, uh, we talk about human rights at every venue. We hold training, and uh, I found them very receptive, but this is a long process, and, they, and there's a history to everything. Um, we also have non-commissioned officer NCO training and development. 
the backbone of our forces are our enlisted and is to the extent that we can grow that and build that in our partners very important and they're they're in from our perspective they're all in but again it's something they have to really work on with a longer view another aspect of this is just general military professional military education training the western hemisphere institute for security in uh, at fort benning we put uh, up, upwards of about 2,000 enlisted officers through that school year, range of courses uh, that deal at the heart in sharing common doctrine, training and tactics with our partners that helps them go back and be more interoperable with us on drug enforcement missions, uh, security, uh, stability type missions. Uh, at the institution level, the Perry Center here in Washington, D.C. is a place where uh, we, they teach the classes in Spanish. It's over at the, in, in adjunct with the National Defense University. And we bring through at the institutional level, well, we're trying to teach our partners the best practices in budgeting and programming and planning so that the important security dollars that they have or that we contribute can be used effectively and appropriately. All these tools we're working each and every day that it's not very high dollar, but it has high impact. And you have to, and the, the, we can measure and see that impact over time. It's, it, it is working. And so, Admiral, I, I take it that you believe that the aid that we provide to the Northern Triangle is crucial to that success. The mill-to-mill -mill security cooperation that, that we're working is showing demonstrated results that are improving the security of the homeland of the United States. Can uh, our partners uh, do more? Uh, they can. I've spoken to all their chiefs of defense in recent weeks and their ministers. Uh, they're committed to do more, uh, and next week we'll host a security conference uh, to ask them to do more, and, uh, and we'll, we'll work towards that goal. Thank you. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Burks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, doing a little bit of research, Nicholas Maduro is quite clearly a socialist, um, but he was elected to the National Assembly as far back as the year 2000, and then was elected again uh, with Chavez in 2012, 2013, this time as vice president. And finally in 2013 was elected president with 50.6% of the vote, more or less. Um, of course, there's always a debate about legitimacy of elections that, that we're familiar with. When we look at Juan Guaido, um, he helped found the Social Democratic Popular Will Party, uh, the research suggests that that is also a socialist uh, organization. Uh, certainly it's a supporter of the Socialist International uh, entity. Uh, he was elected in 2015 to the National Assembly with 26% of the vote. Uh, and the National Assembly later promoted him to the status that he has now. Uh, given that it appears that the fight is between two different sets of socialists, um, both of whom, at least in the original day in which they got into politics, were elected. Is there anything that suggests to you, and feel free any of you that wish to answer, is there anything that says, suggests to any of you that Guaido, if he does assume power in Venezuela, will not also turn out to be a dictator, much like Maduro ended up being? I'll go ahead and take that. I think the important thing to recognize too in, in, in the recent history of when you talk about uh, these are both elected officials is the uh, clear indications of illegitimacy of the last election and the, um, the international community recognizing that it was just, there weren't just questions about the election, but that it was, it was pretty clear that Maduro um, secured himself a continued position. Um, and what's unique now in this particular time versus previous uh, periods of protest within Venezuela, where Maduro clearly didn't have the support of his people, is now we do actually have a um, recognized alternative opposition that um, can, can um, replace him. And so, whereas in the future, you don't ever know what, what in, in the future can bring, what we do know is right now we are living under um, a, a regional disaster caused by one man's d desire to continue to rule that population illegitimately. And, and as Admiral Fowler has uh, described in great detail, the level of um, you know, harm he has brought to his own citizenry um, is not something that we could sit back and just ignore. And so it, the fact that we do have uh, an opposition leader who is now we recognize as the, the legitimate interim president that the international uh, community and the people in Venezuela can rally behind is a significant difference from the past few years. Well, we know that Maduro 
has become a dictator, but we also know that it's his economic policies founded in socialism that have wreaked havoc uh, with that economy, as socialism has done with so many economies around the world at, at various periods of time. Do, do you know anything about Wido that would suggest that he ultimately would not become dictatorial too, which is the essence of socialism, where the government is dictating to the populace what they can and cannot do in an economic uh, ballpark, Anything about Wido that would suggest that he ultimately would not follow that same dictatorial path? I don't think we should assume that he would follow a dictator path. So uh, I think the evidence that we have of um, the hope in him is, is the communications and the relationship we already have between him, his people, and most um, directly our, our Department of State. All right. And again, this, this is a different question. Any of you all want to chime in, please do so. Uh, there have been different suggestions that China, Russia, and Cuba have been involved economically, perhaps even militarily, in trying to prop up uh, the Maduro regime. Is there some way that you all can try to quantify how much each of these three nations are propping up Maduro? I'll take that. The, the uh, estimates of Cuban military strength range between 2,000 and 20,000. Those are accurate. All the guards that surround Maduro are all that, That's a pretty big gap, 2,000 to 20,000. Big gap. All right. So, I'm sorry. Keep going. Uh, the Russian uh, strength is significant. Recently saw 100 uh, uh, personnel fly in, special forces. They're involved in cyber. They're involved in air defense. They're involved in technical training aspect. They recently uh, commissioned a helicopter maintenance facility. Most of the gear, the kit that uh, the Venezuelan military uses, a lot of it is Russian. And China's in there a way that, that, that uh, goes far beyond soft power, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, in the uh, information space as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Um, Ms. Laurie. So, Admiral Fowler, on Sunday of this week, you relieved Admiral Ring as the commander of the Joint Task Force overseeing the, the prison at Guantanamo Bay. Um, this happened a day after the New York Times published a story where he was a critical of the long-term plans for the prison. Was his firing a result of this criticism? Uh, re the firing, uh, the relief for cause of uh, Admiral Ring was in no way related to any media reporting. Okay. It was a result of loss of confidence uh, in an investigation that had completed before, long before any Did of Did anyone media. outside of Southern Command direct or encourage you to fire Admiral Ring? No, that decision was mine. Okay, so for the record, you're saying his firing was unrelated to anything reported in the New York Times? Correct. Um, switching subjects, um, what percentage of your 2019 request for forces specifically for surface combatants was met? We, uh, we received no Navy ships uh, in our 2019 request. After okay. the request, we did receive some fills for exercises and the Navy came through with littoral combat ship. Oh, so to move on on the impact of that, you previously said today that only 6% of the drug shipments that are known are actually interdicted and is I can only assume that this low level is a direct result of the fact that you don't have any uh, specifically Navy assets to help intercept those. And in your comments, you also said all elements of the U.S. government are laser focused on this problem of, you know, uh, stopping drugs flowing into our country. But uh, would you agree that we are not allocating uh, an appropriate amount of naval assets and to work in conjunction with the U.S. Coast Guard, potentially LEADETs on uh, Navy platforms in order to help this problem? The area is the size of the United States, as you know, and uh, we have on any given day six to ten Coast Guard cutters, and now we do have a Navy PC and a USNS uh, fast transport ship, so not, a, not adequate enough forces. So you mentioned the, the EPF, the fast transport ship. Do you find that an effective platform in conjunction with Coast Guard leadettes to be able to help um, for a much lower cost than, say, a DDG or a cruiser operating in the area to be able to get after this problem? Uh, Congresswoman, the, the finishing part of that discussion on the, the Navy's readiness, which I have knowledge of, is, is certainly impacted here, too. So it, it, when we look globally, there's just not enough naval assets. The EPF is a, is a good platform. We, there needs to be some fixes made, a military sea lift command in the Navy to the, uh, a couple of the systems that, that assist okay. in sea keeping and boat launching. We get past those uh, shortfalls. That, that platform will be a good platform for a detection and monitoring drug interdiction operation. Thank you. And a final topic, we've talked a lot about Chinese and investment in the Panama Canal region and um, within South America. 
And some in the current administration have invoked the Monroe Doctrine when speaking of Latin America. Do you think the United States should, should use the concept of the Monroe Doctrine or an approach similar in Latin America regarding the increasing Chinese influence and Russian influence? I'd leave uh, the application of Monroe Doctrine to policy and, and uh, policymakers. Uh, the, the committed, enduring promise of partnership is what we ought to focus on, and that's what we are focused on. Would you see that any differently if this economic expansion and investment in port facilities and the different activities that you've uh, described was expanded to an actual uh, military base within South America? If we, re if we make the right investments in time, people, location, uh, training, education, the full range of security cooperation, I'm convinced that we'll be the partner of choice and we'll maintain those long-term relationships. It troubles me that China is on a path to have permanent bases in this uh, in this hemisphere, I, I believe that they are, uh, based on my own assessments of their intent and capability around the world. So to dovetail further on the discussion about naval assets and your ability to, to conduct drug interdiction mission, I would only assume the fact that you had zero assets allocated to you, you know, intentionally, deliberately allocated to you for your mission last year. The same thing would apply that you don't feel like you have a sufficient naval assets to show presence in the region or to do theater security cooperation with our allies as far as naval assets is concerned. Congresswoman, the two, absolutely, two go hand in hand. Uh, we, we've created a concept with our fourth fleet to build a, a, a combined maritime task force with U.S. naval leadership and naval assets. We believe that'll bring more out of our partners as we work and train together, both for the drug mission and across all the range of missions that we have in this hemisphere. But just to clarify, it's a little bit hard to do that if you don't actually have any ships assigned to the fourth fleet. You absolutely can't win a football game without players on the field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our hearing. I thank you for your testimony and uh, all the members for their questions. And uh, we are adjourned.